Ohio Street and Marshfield Avenue, or I think it's called Avenue or Street or whatever. And beyond that, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, Frank Sinatra was singing about State Street, and I didn't care anything about State Street. If I wrote a song, it would be about uh, Mario's submarine sandwich on the corner. We used to play baseball right across from it, and if we got got a hold of this little rubber ball, sometimes we'd break the apartment windows on the on the top, and then we'd run away. And he happened to be my uncle, so I had to stay away from him for a while. Or I'd write a song about Batista's lemonade stand, uh, fish stand that had uh, sold the homemade Italian lemonade. Or I'd write a song about at this bakery that filled the air with this goods. So that was for me. That was Chicago. Uh, it also was small town because we felt safe. We were all uh, we all knew each other. Um, I lived three houses away from the grade school. We had, uh, and that was not a coincidence. My, that my parents would find an apartment three doors, three houses away from the from uh, the school because why? I had to come home for lunch. Uh, every day I'd come home for lunch. Uh, and we had these these characters in, in this little small town that we lived in. Uh, Grandma Weeds and uh, Crazy Willie and Crazy Angie. Who, years later, uh, she's related by, by marriage to me and, and they're related in a distant way. But we real, I realized as an adult, she was schizophrenic. And they just locked her up in her second floor apartment every day and nobody ever saw her after a certain point and i see old footage where she's at the parties and she seemed fine but somewhere online she must have gotten schizophrenia and that's not that's something you talked about back then oh you know, there's no cure right awesome. there's still a, there's still a, i know uh some distinct memories i have of growing up in chicago this is going to seem like a silly and trivial thing uh but if it evokes your own memories i think that'll be enough every meal we would have a salad and we would have bread every meal. I remember my dad looking at bread one day when he was maybe 70 or 75. Says, every day I eat bread. Uh, and every day we know buy bread. My mom would make bread every day. She'd have bread enough for every day. So the best part of the meal, though, was after you were done. You know where this is going. <laughs> so dip that bread in the vinegar and oil. And that's one of the you know fondest memories I had. <laughs> Uh, another <clears throat> common memory uh, or distinct memory is uh, adults barely interacted with kids. Uh, we played our own games. We, we umpired our own games. We refereed our own games. I didn't even know about Little League. I had no idea that that even existed. We played 16 in softball. No one exercised, but we ran all day. We played 16 in yeah. softball. And I didn't realize that everybody else in Chicago was playing 16 in softball. Uh, but, and I didn't realize it was a Chicago thing until I was well into adulthood. Uh, no one picked up dog shit. <laughs> I might need some confirmation about that, but I remember stepping in a lot of dog shit as a kid. If you, if you were to pick up dog shit when you were a kid, it went back then, they would have said, what are you doing? Why are you picking up dog shit? <laughs> Can you confirm this or no? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you have these memories and they're so distinct and you're so real, but I, I don't know if they're correct. Uh, no one drank bottled water. Not that, they're, oh, no. not that bottled water existed. Hose. Hose. Yeah, the hose. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody seemed dehydrated. Everybody's <laughs> uh, No one wore bike helmets. No. Uh, we listened to the radio all day. There are two stations we listened to. What were they? LS, CFL. WLS, WLS WCFL. Uh, my... Mom and dad never talked about work. They didn't take any pride in their work. They just did it because they had to do it. And my, my dad would go to work at Hart Shafter and Marks during the day. He'd come home and, my, and there would be like an hour overlap where no parents was there. My mom would go off to the factory to uh, work in some factory near the house. And uh, so they, they never saw each other, which was probably good. <laughs> so we didn't have a lot of money and we didn't have a car. We didn't go on vacations. Uh, the only place we ever went to was Lincoln Park Zoo. And we ate well when we went to Lincoln Park Zoo. There were these meatloaf sandwiches wrapped in wax paper that became all full of oil and i was uh i could still taste those sandwiches those, those were the best. Um, very few people questioned authority especially within the catholic church we had this eighth grade reunion we were only like uh, 18 of us in the graduating class so somehow we got we communicated about six of us had uh 
a reunion. And we, we actually uh, drove by the school, St. Colin Hill and Grandin Ashland. And a guy happened to be coming out and we said, can we go in? And so we went in and we're walking up the flight of stairs and Joey Gerbach, he, he says, yeah, this is where sister, I don't remember her name, sister Rosemary pushed me down the stairs. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was not a good kid. And uh, she was in his face and I don't think she meant to push me down the stairs, but he fell down the stairs because of her. And so... This must be quick thinking on his part. He just would lie there. He didn't move. No. They called him a mom, and the mom came. And the mom, uh, you could probably predict the reaction of the mom. She said, what are you doing? She she didn't believe the kid. <laughs> no one was going to question uh, the, 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 the principal. And uh, the last thing before I do a, a, just a short reading from the, the essay in here is that uh, sadly, my, my family didn't teach us much about uh, being Italian. They spoke a dialect. Uh, I think they wanted to assimilate, so they wanted to speak yeah. English at home. Uh, and the, the dialect was so crude that it didn't really help me much when I went to, when I went to Italy, especially with Venice. It was like a different language. Uh, but when I got closer to Naples, where I'm from, then it became a, a lot clearer. But and I wish they could have brought us to a place like this. They didn't know it existed. I didn't know it existed. Uh, they didn't tell us stories about Italy. And I think maybe that's what drove me to write stories because uh, I was uh, craving stories. I was empty of stories. Uh, by the way, I have a, a, my own novel here. And this is a young kid who's here on his own time. I can't believe it. I'm, so I'm gonna give him one of my books. <laughs> Uh, there's another young person, Megan, over here, who's from the uh, U of I. Uh, no, University of Illinois, UIC. UIC, okay. Uh, and you look a little kind of young too. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm also from UIC. I didn't work on this project though. I'm okay. Here, if you want me to see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, the only <clears throat> I'm going to lose my voice here. The only cultural thing that uh, that uh, they communicated to us that that they uh, sent to me was surrounding food. You know, they canned tomatoes oh, and they bake bread and they bake their, make their own pasta. And now I make my own pasta and it's just so exciting to make your own pasta. If you, if you haven't done it, it's, it's really simple. Eggs and uh, flour. So you need a little bit of water. Just get some recipe. So I'm just gonna read this part of this and then I'll have the editors uh, talk a little bit about the book as a whole. You know what Ring Alivio is? What? Did anybody ever play Ring the Yeah. Yeah. You did? I'll explain it here, but I'm just, well, I'm just curious to see how many uh, played it. It's kind of an elaborate version of Freeze Tag. At night, we played elaborate rounds of Ring the where one team hid and the other would have to find, tag, and bring the hiders back to the jail at the school steps. If four people were captured, let's say, an uncaptured teammate could spring out and duck between guards to tag and free his entire team. And that was really ah. exciting. I can still feel the ache in my chest from running too long. Other nights we played kick the can, caught lightning bugs, put them in jars, listened to 45s and LPs on battery operated record players, walked to Batista's fish store for Italian lemonade, bought steaming hot dogs covered with fresh onions and chopped tomatoes from a man with a, in a cart with a cart, uh, stuck our ears close to street lights to hear the buzz reverberating through the pole and eavesdropped on adult conversations. <laughs> this is the only fond memory I have of adults, men and women sitting around in lawn chairs and meeting each other's house, meeting at each other's houses for coffee and pastries. Their talk was loud, devoid of weighty matters, at least I can't recall much, but there was an intimacy and casualness to their talk that I still admire and miss. I feel as if I grew up with three languages, English, Italian, and Chicago. Most of the adults sitting on lawn chairs that night were fluent in all three times. Hey, what yo, Benny Qua, tell me, you want two or three sugar in your coffee? <laughs> right? Is, what, what the heck does Wally, why yo mean? My dad would say all the time. Why yo, why yo? Young boy. Why yo? Why yo? Why yo? Why yo? It was a very affectionate thing. 
I never knew exactly what it meant, but thank yeah. you. At least he wasn't calling me like bastard or something. <laughs> <laughs> that would have changed everything. <laughs> when my first novel came out, I imagined friends from the old neighborhood and even a few relatives remarked, Hey, Anthony, how did you write those sentences? You don't talk nothing like that. <laughs> so sometimes I wonder the same. When I talk to people, my thought process and my very vocabulary is different than when I sit down to write. <laughs> I suspect the difference has something to do with my fear of seeming pretentious, which would have made me a pariah in the old neighborhood and probably in my own house, where I didn't have much use for the private vocabulary and cadences I was creating during my reading time. Which, while much of this might sound idyllic, and it, certain feel, and it certainly feels that way to me, vendors passing through our street on wooden carts selling lupini beans and sunflower seeds, tomatoes, watermelon, others peddling a sharpening tool for scissors and knives calling the mothers to bring out their dull blades. The neighborhood did include tensions. Gangs such as the gay lords and the Latin kings painted their emblems on sidewalks. I don't think they would use the word gay lord. It doesn't sound so intimidating. It's not <laughs> <laughs> One time I felt the foundation of our apartment quake from the vibration of a light bulb, light pole being torn from its base and landing a few feet from our front door, all of which I discovered after rushing outside. One time, a Puerto Rican family tried to move into our neighborhood, but moved out Ooh. shortly after when a brick shattered their picture window. I never saw a black person in our neighborhood until maybe 1968, though I knew that a black neighborhood wasn't far away. After Martin Luther King Jr. was shot, I felt a visceral fear that riots would overtake our streets. You'd think that we would, talk, we would have talked about some of these tensions at school, but no, St. Callum killed preferred to remain insulated from the worries of the outside world. We learned our multiplication tables and memorized our catechism lessons and recited our confessions. But we didn't talk about injustice or intolerance or anything remotely political. The one exception was my seventh grade teacher for whom we campaigned, handing out leaflets for his aldermanic aspirations. He was the cool teacher with the long hair that everyone liked. <laughs> How did this Chicago upbringing shape me? I'm not sure because I was always chronically shy as a boy, always on the periphery of the action. I feel as, I've been, as if I've been watching people my entire life, but the watching has been of Chicago, and I think the city has become part and parcel of my DNA. And through my observations, I've learned that you shouldn't throw things at other people or at other people's houses, regardless of who lives in those houses, but that this does happen. If you stand by and watch, the brick tossing will happen again. I've learned that people aren't gonna give you things for free, but if you scrape, you're gonna make a pretty good living. I've learned that young people can negotiate this world fairly well on their own, that they don't need to rely on adults to call balls and strikes and to make everything right for them. I've learned to root for the underdog because in a city of big shoulders, high rises dwarfing the many factories dotting the boulevards and the avenues, not everyone is on equal footing. Not everyone can prosper without a helping hand or a fighting chance. I just met them today. I've been, I've been communicating with Lauren for, for two or three years now. And she said, oh, yeah, we're going to have this book out. And I said, oh, sure, right. Yeah. <laughs> so finally, uh, finally, it came out. So we're the editors of, of and, and Roxanne Pilot, who's an ex Oh, yeah. Who has shown up at one of these uh, occasions? Uh, I could, I mean, 
what's Italian? If you have a Picciolini and, and Romano in the room, these are not like, they, they're not obviously out of the same family, right? But they're both Italian. And Anne Calcagno, I don't know if you know her work. Oh, but, yeah. They're Italians in lots of So So if you, if you just read the three stories of Italian Americans, that like it would be such a rich and diverse uh -huh. sort of sense of what it means to be Italian. You, you couldn't just focus on one thing, right? So the idea was to um, was to celebrate. Yes, talk about growing up in Chicago in various and diverse neighborhoods. So we've done that, um, and and then also to to um, you know help people remember the great Chicago writers um, and, and and keep these these stories circulating and and help to sell books for people like Romano. Um, uh, what, what else would you like to say about Oh, uh, I think you mentioned kind of the youth and one of the, the premise for this actually was um, Dave and some colleagues years ago talking, we, we do English ed, so training teachers or students become teachers in high schools. And the idea was, wouldn't it be great to use some of this in high school classrooms and teach students really about where they come from, from the people who come from here as well. You have a question? Yeah, will you take a credit card? Or does it have to I don't know how we don't know how to do this. We're <laughs> <laughs> still figuring it out. Please, please stop. I'll give you one. I'll give you. I'll trust you. I'll, you can. You can send the twenty bucks. Oh. <laughs> we need to get like one of those card readers. We do. We do. We don't know anything about this. We, we've been working on this book. We don't. You know. We we know nothing about. Uh, although Megan's gonna help. Megan will. Us. Help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, you know this idea of culture and where we come from, and we all. Well, I love the assignment you said. Strangest thing or coolest thing in your neighborhood, because we talk about things from I think a, a really structured way, and we like Tony want to do more and have people really kind of what are your experiences and tell your own story. So it kind of started out in that way, but as we collected stories and talked with authors. It kind of we we realized what a rich, um, just like comprehensive but also cohesive grouping of stories it was from people's uh, backgrounds all across the city and how much more we could do. So it appeals to adults too. Emil Ferris did our cover and she's got a part of her memoir in the book or story in the book. It's not a memoir, I think. Um, but this idea of what the city means, what how neighborhoods connect. My dad is from Grand Avenue over that way. And I was just on the phone with him yesterday talking about um, stories. He got in touch with a cousin and they were going over all the family history of, you know, just things. And we had, so we had a little thing that I think is kind of a funny but important story. I kept having to email Tony because the press wanted to change the spelling of Ringolavio. Am I saying it right? Oh. And we kept going back saying, but this is how he wrote it. And he's Italian, you would know. And they're like, oh, but we looked it up on Google and it's spelled this way. And we're like, what, no. So we had to kind of, you know, we, we fought the good fight. And I told you, did they spell it the way you did? And yeah, it was not good, the final copy. As kids, we didn't spell it. <laughs> yeah, <he's> like, <laughs> <laughs> you never spelled it. So it was supposed to be, so the original idea was, Let's get this into schools so that everybody could see. I'm an author too. I have a neighborhood. I can yeah. write about that. I, and I have growing up stories. It's true when they're younger. The stories are more about when they're very young. But but then we then we began to see that there was a great interest beyond the classroom that that people would read these stories and then immediately think, as happened when you were reading this morning, of their own stories. You know that that it gets, it gets triggered it's it's uh it's generative and, you know you you hear a you hear a um you're a detail from from his growing up story it, it makes you think of your own right that's that, that that's the way it works so anyway thanks for uh, yeah, uh, just right, question. question. How, how did you select the authors did you do an open call or did you and select them well it's a little complicated i mean early on i, I was doing this myself and it wasn't going too well at the beginning. And I and I and I started to get, I started to invite undergraduate students to come in like Megan. And I would say, 
oh, you're Italian? Uh, go, it, it, it's surely someone found Tony and said, oh, you have to get Tony Romano, his book is perfect. And, um, and uh, I didn't grow up in Chicago. So part of, the, part of the reason for the book is also that it, it was to get to know Chicago and, and have, you know, and, you know, to, to know authors who, who write about Chicago, right? Anyway, um, now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, oh, oh! So, we, so, so, some some of these undergraduates would go out and they'd go to like like a Russian studies program, or they'd go to the Hungarian Cultural Center, or you know, and um, and um, so it was just really kind of. I mean, I think you would look at it and say, "Oh, why don't you have this Thai American?" You know, we, like, we didn't know. We didn't know. So it was really kind of uh, serendipity in, in some ways. It was like word of mouth. Uh, you know, when you go on websites, you say, you, you know, anybody can do this through Google, right? You just, you just you say, who are, who, are the, who are the best Chicago story you know, uh, authors that write about growing up in Chicago? Um, yeah. Was it, was it, are you trying to cover like different neighborhoods, so to speak, uh, or ethnic or both? The original idea was, um, it started with the fact that most kids in schools really read dead white men stories, right? And, and um, old, you know, they're dead, really. You know, they're not living right. And, um, they buy, and they're mostly white people. We're white people too, but we thought they should, they, you know, they should read a range of because Chicago is incredibly diverse, and, and most books that you read in school are not that diverse. And so, so we thought you know, the first idea was ethnicity, but then somebody, you know, maybe an undergraduate would say, Well, what about gay Chicago? Or what, what about like one person even said, Well, you know, what about homeless Chicago? So, we found a book about a homeless guy in Chicago. Uh, it's not in the book now, but. Um, you know, so it was uh, starting with the notion of ethnic diversity in neighborhoods to it kind of goes hand in hand. Right? It does. It does. I mean, you kind of cover both with a neighborhood. Yeah. And the growing up piece was really important that Adam made because again, the premise was high school. So can high schoolers relate to these experiences? So it, so it was tricky to find. Like we had people that were Chicago writers writing about culture and neighborhoods, but not necessarily at the age of uh, high school or you know, middle school, yeah, adolescence. So, so this is brand new. I want to say this, that the, the official date, the official rollout for this was May 15th. So wow. you, know, oh, you can this, smell the print. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And as we worked on it too, then we said, okay, there will be a volume two and a three, like we could keep going and other cities could do that, you know, so really kind of started with all of it. Other, other questions? Thanks for thanks for allowing us. Yeah,